Are we going? Let's go. Uh, my name is Kathy Obradovich. I am uh, currently the political columnist for the Des Moines Register. I'm about to become the opinion editor of the Des Moines Register. My job just changed. Uh, so thank you. I, I told them that it's okay that the uh, program has my old title because I'm still going to keep doing that job until the end of the legislative session. So it's not out of date yet. Um, I, I also uh, wanted to just thank everybody for being here. As a member uh, of the Green Advisory Council, I helped plan this uh, event, and uh, we are really more than excited uh, at the turnout and uh, all the interest here. So thank you very much for, for showing the interest here today. Um, uh, one, uh, also one other change, uh, Randy Evans, one of our panelists, uh, unfortunately uh, came down with a nasty bug and can't be here today. Uh, but we have a, 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 an all-star group here and we will more than cover the topic. So um, to start with, uh, we have uh, Walker McCusick, um, he is with, uh, uh, pro I always want to call it Project Vote Smart because that's what they used to call it back in the days when I used to uh, engage with them all the time for political information. He, it, it's now just called Vote Smart and is now based at Drake University here in Iowa, which is fantastic. Um, he is the national director and Vote Smart is a nonprofit organization which is dedicated to providing free, factual, and non-biased information about Public, public officials and candidates. What a concept, right? Um, and then uh, we also uh, have Mike Giudicesi. Uh, he is there in the middle. He is, the, he is a partner um, with the Des Moines Office of Begri Baker Daniels, um, and he is a First Amendment lawyer. He specializes in First Amendment cases. Uh, and one of his clients uh, for a long time has been the Des Moines Register. Uh, we have all worked with him on uh, him. He's been keeping us out of trouble for years. Um, and he's also helped us get into trouble when it comes to challenging um, public officials and governments uh, on, on their, their open meetings, open records, and First Amendment and free press cases. So we really appreciate his presence here on the panel. And uh, last but not least, uh, Jennifer Jacobs, who is a Greenlee graduate. Um, and she's currently White House reporter for Bloomberg News, which is amazing. Um, she ha also spent time at the Des Moines Register as a, a reporter, um, including some time working with me on the politics decks. She's covered uh, presidential campaigns uh, and uh, the legislature and other uh, politics in Iowa. So let's give the panel uh, a round. So we're organized a little differently than the first panel. What we'd like to do is have each of our panelists just make a brief opening statement. Um, I will start with a couple of questions, but we want to leave the bulk of our time for your questions. Um, this is a really important topic. I think the first panel probably whet your appetite, I hope, uh, for some, some questions for our expert panelists. Um, so be thinking about the, the questions that you would like to ask, and, and we will give you uh, we, the panelists really wanted to give you the bulk of the time, and you can ask them anything you like. So, so Walker, start us off. Well, thank you for the kind introduction, Kathy. Uh, my name is Walker, and I'm the national director of Vote Smart. Um, Vote Smart um, is a group of Americans from across the country, um, young, old, from the left and from the right, who have come together on one common principle that we share, and that is that facts matter. Um, it's a principle that goes back to our founding almost 30 years ago when a group of national leaders, including enemies like Presidents Carter, President Ford, at least wanted to work on one thing together, and that was voter education in a nonpartisan way. Um, they believed, and we still believe, that information, factual and clear, is crucial to our civic health. Um, and we still, to this day, collect those six key areas of data on candidates and officials. Um, decades ago, um, what we were facing in some ways at our founding was a lack of information problem. Um, of course, there were political parties themselves, news media that distributed information on candidates and officials, but there was a challenge sometimes with down ballot state legislators, those in smaller districts, and we operated a hotline, if you can believe it, 20 years ago, even 15 years ago, where people would call in to this toll-free number and we'd have a staff of 30 student interns who would answer people's questions, look things up in this database. We crashed the phone lines in the Northwest one time. Um, but uh, fortunately, in many ways, we've grown up alongside uh, that great, challenging, exciting, sometimes frustrating tool, uh, the internet. 
And now we're mostly delivering our tools through a website online, votesmart.org, um, to tens of millions of users in our past 2016 election cycle, as well as an online uh, mobile app on point that we released last year. So our, the way of delivering data has changed. Our scope has changed in that we can reach many more people through these tools as opposed to just the hotline that we still have. The challenge, though, is that we're not the only website out there, believe it or not. Um, a lot of other sources of information have grown up with the internet, which really lowers the barriers to entry, the barriers to information distribution. And in some ways, what we face now is an over-information problem. We say that facts matter. We say that you can get facts through us. Uh, but you can find a lot of other facts out there. And you can find probably any fact you're looking for just by finding the right source on the internet. Um, and what we, our challenge currently is, is to demonstrate what is trustworthy information and why that trustworthy information is important to you, to us as voters and as citizens. Um, we do that, like I said, through our own online tools, but we also try to work with media as much as possible. Like Kathy said, journalists use our resources. We try to help them use our resources, especially on the some of the challenging topics we cover, because that is another important conduit to inform voters, which at the bottom line is our mission. So we still think, of course, that facts matter, even in this post-fact era, whatever you want to call it. But the battle and the challenge we face is different. It's firstly to encourage and inspire people to demand factual information. And once that battle has been won, to teach people and show them what is reliable information. VoteSmart's just one small part of that. We're not all the facts in the world. But VoteSmart, I think the media using us can also be one smart part of that challenge. Thanks, Walker. Hey, Michael, I've, I neglected to mention that uh, this is the iCubs home opener today, and Michael is, is a managing partner, uh, is a partner in the Iowa Cubs organization. So if you guys do have AAA baseball questions, he, he could probably field those as well. <laughs> Go ahead. I can talk to you about baseball. I can talk to you about a lot of different things that I know very little about. But, uh, <laughs> uh, first of all, I, I want to just say thank you for letting me come to the Iowa State campus and hear I've had a history of suing Iowa State during my career. <laughs> and it's nice to be in a room with a bunch of cyclones who are smiling and have welcomed me here. <laughs> but I won't be joining you for lunch. <laughs> I, I thought I'd tell you a story, though. One, uh, one time I was taking Warren Madden's deposition, and Warren Madden's one of my favorite people. I think he's just a wonderful individual who was a great survivor. And uh, uh, it was taking his deposition, and it was a kind of a long day, and it involved a lawsuit of all things against the Iowa State Daily. And uh, we were at a break, and I said, well, Warren, my, my children are high school age. Uh, I probably should uh, discourage them from thinking about Iowa State, because it had been a long, intense deposition. And so he paused. He said, no, they'd be welcome here. <laughs> And then he paused, and if you know Warren and, and the smile that he has, he says, but they probably shouldn't go into journalism. <laughs> well, I think that his advice was, was probably not based on where journalism has come in those 20 years since that deposition. I think it was just being friendly advice about uh, their dad's last name was the same as their, or their last name was the same as their father's. But if you look at where things are going, um, I, I think we all worry about the sky is falling. But if you think about it, and uh, if you look at the Radio Act of 1934, people thought that the, the sky was falling back in 1934. And then with television, and with every medium that comes along, we, we I think, fear the medium rather than embrace the information. And what I hope we can all do is look at, at protecting voices like we always sought to protect voices that you're going to hear more and more about regulation and, and the Facebook information and the Facebook breaches, people are saying it's okay to regulate. Well, is it okay to regulate? And should you allow regulation? And I think that those are the issues that you should be worried about and those are the issues that you should be concerned about. Not whether there's fake news, not whether there are cheats and liars, but whether there's government telling you what you can and cannot say. And that, I think, is far more invasive and far more threatening than a cycle of bad actors. Because what we ought to hope is all of us who believe in information and in believe in truth is that in the end, reliable sources of information and those who tell the truth 
will be those who still have people who listen and seek their information and ultimately pay for that information. And so what I hope we can talk about a little bit is, is some of the threats. But the threats we are creating ourselves in many ways. But the threats also come with freedom. If we are going to let everyone speak, then we're going to have along the way people who we wish had not or messages that we wish they had not said. And then lastly, I, I, we're going to have this whole thing about privacy coming up. And I hope what we can differentiate is various levels of privacy. And I want to, I want to be provocative in a way. Um, as, as many of you know, I worked with Barbara Mack for years, and I think that this conference shouldn't go without somebody mentioning Barbara. Barbara would have been... <laughs> but in, in the spirit of what Barbara would do to provoke you to think and provoke me to, 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 to watch where, how far I might go, think about three sources of information, or three levels of privacy. Think about privacy from the standpoint of government information and what government holds and how much access should you have to that. Then think about your personal data and then think about your personal information. And if you were to equate these to one being a musket and another to being a rifle and the third to being an AR-15, which ones are you willing to protect and which ones are you willing to allow? And if you were to say we shouldn't regulate any of those guns, then why would you say we should regulate any of that personal information? And I use the NRA as an example because we were, Walker and I were speaking earlier. The NRA protects the Second Amendment, but it can't do it without the First Amendment. We protect the Second Amendment and we don't need the second, I'm sorry, we protect the First Amendment, but we don't need guns and rifles to do it. We need thought and we need freedom. And so in the era of fake news, I think we need to go back and say, freedom is every bit as important as any gun and any ammunition. And if you value the second, you better value the first. Right. That just gives me goosebumps, by the way, <laughs> doesn't it? Amen. To all uh, that. Jennifer's right in the eye of the hurricane in the White House, uh, the, covering Donald Trump um, and the administration. Tell us what your experience is. Great. So neutrality and objectivity, I think, are the two most important things to protecting credibility in, in journalism. And I can talk a little bit more about that. But the first thing everyone always asks me, I'm one of six White House reporters for Bloomberg. So one of the six of us is always with the president, whether he's in the White House, on Air Force One, Mar-a-Lago, Bedminster, overseas, wherever he is, one of the six of us is with him at all times in the same location. And people always ask me, does it drive you crazy to cover this president? Well, no, no, it, it doesn't. I think it's a fascinating story. Um, we're exhausted all the time because it really is 5 a.m., 6 a.m. until 11 p.m. every single day. But it doesn't feel, I think when people talk about the chaos in the White House, what they're really referring to is the quality of journalism. There's so many great stories that come out about this administration that we're always trying to keep up with each other and trying to match another news outlet's reporting or we're trying to be the first to report on something. So a lot of the chaos is, 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 is just great news stories breaking about what's happening behind the scenes in this White House. It doesn't feel like this administration is any more chaotic than it was on day one. This president has been breaking expectations and doing things to throw us for a loop since the very first day. So we're kind of used to the pace of it, which is pretty much like the day before the Iowa caucuses every single day in this White House. Um, but I'm pretty apolitical, so it, it, it's not har hard for me to stay calm. Um, Trump didn't invent distrust in the media. It was already there. Um, many people thought that the media had some sort of a, a liberal lean to it, that we're elite, that we're out of touch. And the best thing I learned from my journalism professors and from Kathy when she was my, my editor was just to be regular, rigorously neutral, that there is no room in hard news journalism for having any bias, having any sort of judgment. 
And that's a weird phenomenon in, in DC and New York. I'll see a lot of hard news reporters who will be very straight and fair in their print product or whatever they put out you know, as their official, but then they get in front of a microphone on TV or radio and they suddenly turn into opinion journalists. And one of the best uh, pieces of advice that Kathy O gave me when I worked for the Des Moines Register was, you're not a pundit, you're a hard news reporter. Stick to the facts. And that's what I've, I've really done since then. Um, one of the students at um, the Stoneman Douglas School said something that really struck me the other day. She said something about journalism is a form of activism. And there are hard news reporters who think that that kind of mentality is what's killing trust in journalism. Um, opinion writing certainly can be a form of activism, sure. But journalism, hard news journalism, is not activism. It's presenting the facts honestly and objectively. Um, we can point out the ironies. We can point out the president's errors. And we can point out historical context and his exaggerations or whatever. But with no judgment, with neutrality, we can call his bluff. We can question the spin from their, their spokespeople politely but firmly but without judgment. Um, and so that's a lot of what I do is just trying to get pack, past the roadblocks, get past the front door of the White House and, and figure out what the reality of, of what is, is happening to get past the spin, um, but completely neutrally. <laughs> Jennifer, I, I want to just ask a couple questions of the, of the whole panel first, and uh, then uh, I've got one, basically one question for each of you, and then let's open it up to the floor. So be thinking of your questions. Jennifer, what do you think poses the biggest threat to media credibility right now? Is it uh, external threats like the Russian bots and the um, you know, fake news rhetoric from uh, politicians? Or is it internal, um, you know, yeah. the use of social media? You mentioned a couple of other things um, that, we, you know, are we doing this to ourselves? Uh, I do think that we do do it to ourselves a little bit. Um, I think we need to provide context. When, you, when the White House criticizes us, criticizes us as fake news, there's a lot of different factors there. What they're trying to get at is they're trying to say that they sense some bias, that they don't feel like the mainstream media is completely honest and, 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 and factual all the time. Um, I do agree with that to some extent. I'm not saying I agree with the president of the White House calling us fake news, but there's, there's more nuance to why they, they do that. Um, the media doesn't always get it right. Uh, we, we had some news stories just yesterday where I, I just was puzzled at, at why news outlets would report some of those things. If you did some basic fact checking, you would find out that it, it that wasn't true. Um, a lot of times when the president calls us fake news, it's because he disagrees with what we're reporting. He wants more praise from us a lot of times. He wants more adoration. Um, if he doesn't want to talk about something, he'll say something is fake news. Like he t called the Stormy Daniels story fake news, and, and I think that was partly because he just didn't want to talk about it. Um, He'll call us fake news if he thinks that we're being elitist, if we don't understand something, if we don't understand his voters. Um, in Ohio, at a rally the other day, he, he said something about fake news, and it was he was saying the fake news media didn't understand that the ratings, the 18 million, 18 million rating um, viewers that Roseanne got for her first debut show of her new um, new series, that the, the media didn't understand that it's about his voters, and, and the reason why he got they got so many viewers was because it's about us. And he said, they haven't figured it out yet. The fake news hasn't figured it out. So a lot of times he'll, he'll say something is fake news if he thinks we're just not connecting and understanding you know, the movement. Um, there is some, some fake news out there. We, we get operatives who will plant fake news with us, operatives who will tell us three things and two things will be real and we'll be able to, to back it up and find out that and, and verify it. And then the third thing we can't verify, but we think, well, the first two things were accurate, so the source must be right, and we publish it, and it's, it's, it's planted, and it's absolutely not true. Um, other, there's uh, journalists who don't do a lot of fact-checking, like Michael Wolff's book was, a lot of it was um, unsubstantiated. He, he admits that. He didn't do a lot of fact-checking. He just would take rumors and, and you know, things that he had heard, and, and, he, and he printed them as fact in a, in a book. Um, there's many things about that book that I could talk about that. Um, the other thing is, uh, the president will get annoyed with us and call it fake news if we publish things from sources that are clearly someone who has an axe to grind. And, I'll, and I know I've fallen prey to that sometimes, and I've seen other journalists do it as well, where we'll rely on sources outside of the White House who will tell us things, 
who may or may, they may or may not be plugged in, but they do have an, an ax to, to grind. So there's so many different nuances to, he, when he calls it fake news, it, it means so many different things. And, and to answer your question, I do think a lot of it could be repaired by journalists, just being a little bit more rigorous and a little bit more careful. But it, it is not helpful to have uh, the President of the United States trying to destroy our credibility all the time and trying to, to, to chip away at the, the confidence of the American people in, in journalism as a whole. And Michael, same question to you. You mentioned internal threats and external threats. Um, which is the, I think probably both are, are real, but which, which one should we be paying more attention to and, and how, do we, how do we push back at those threats? Well, this may surprise you, but I fear internal threats more than I do external. What I would define external, because I look at it, 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 it from a perspective of a lawyer, is that you're going to get sued and you're going to have to defend and then you may lose. Now, getting sued itself is expensive and that, that extracts a tax or a cost on an operation, but, but losing uh, more times than not uh, I, the appellate courts in the case of libel or an invasion of privacy will come on the side of the news organization because of the First Amendment. So until we have erosion of the First Amendment, until we have erosion in the courts, uh, I would say that the internal threat is greater. And what is that internal threat? I think it's twofold. First of all, the internal threat is, number one, funding. That as traditional news organizations have become underfunded, then they become under uh, understaffed and the, the likelihood of error increases. And I, I think Jennifer's absolutely right. Facts ought to be the, the, the paramount standard. And if we fail on facts, then we fail on many levels. We fail on trust, and we may fail legally if we don't have facts. And so if, if newsrooms don't have a buffer between uh, a reporter in the field who inputs the information on an iPhone and immediately it's posted and never edited. I'm concerned about that. I'm concerned that, that we don't have fact checking. I'm concerned that we don't have the information that's being reviewed and being uh, contemplative and thoughtful in reporting rather than immediate. So those are the in, in kind of internal threats. And the other internal threat besides funding is this idea that we've got to be first rather than be right. And, and I'm deeply concerned that, that that is in a world where people are, where, where you, if you're in a news organization, you consider Facebook and Twitter to be your competition. There is no right or wrong about Facebook or Twitter. It's simply someone's observation with or without a bias. And if you're looking for respected information sources, but those respected information sources are lowering themselves to a standard of immediacy is the only thing that matters, then I think that's a great threat, short term and long term. And Walker, uh, you're not a part of you're not a journalism organization, but uh, you know you observe this, and uh, you know I, I I wonder if you're sitting sometimes with this uh, this stockpile of factual information and you're wondering. Okay, people, here it is. Where are you? You know, what's your, what do you observe as far as uh, media credibility and the concerns that you have? Sure, and I think I can speak a little, a little bit to how we've interacted with news media organizations. Um, definitely have observed some of the short, the short resources. Uh, a lot of times reporters do contact us, and the amount of information they've been given or been able to gather at that point in the story actually always surprises me or other members of our staff, and we're here to help them just like anyone else. Um, I think uh, that a lot of the time the information we have, we try to communicate with reporters and journalists is that we have it archived for them um, in that so many pieces of information can be out there for a certain amount of time, but a tweet may come down. Um, a rating from the NRA may come down. Um, and one of our jobs is to be archival in that sense. Um, and a lot of times we are sitting on that big stockpile and we, try to provide reporters with the long-term perspective of, yes, we might have this month's rating for a candidate, but we also have 10 years' worth of rating for them, um, or if they're looking at their statements or their voting records, to try to encourage them to get that long-term context, which we recognize they might not have the time resources for. It's a challenge that we have to work at with, with reporters. Um, I remember a couple years ago, in 2016, The Guardian did a piece on the relationship between uh, NRA 
ratings for candidates as well as funding uh, through lobbying efforts using a combination of our data and that of one of our partners, Open Secrets. And there was a little more hand-holding than we expected there to be. We were really excited to be working with them and to help them work on this piece that was based on the facts that have been highlighted as so important. Um, but we realized that sometimes the resources aren't there necessarily to truly understand them. That's part of why we're here, though. Well, let me ask you this. Um, how do we communicate um, to the public uh, and to voters, uh, the value uh, and the importance of having factual information and, and make them expect it and demand it. I mean, we, you know, in online social media, um, the public has an opportunity to hold journalists, journalism and journalists, journalists accountable. So how do you encourage people to really demand factual information and, and act on it? Right. This, this is, I think, the biggest challenge we're facing as an organization through voter education is that, yes, we can put out uh, a list of all of a candidate's votes, a list of all their statements, you can navigate them, but is that as fun, is that as something you demand as much as following their Twitter or following another pundit or another news source or another information <laughs> source? One of the things we're trying to do is just try different approaches to voter education. Our core products try to allow people just to navigate by their zip code, by their address, or by the name of their candidate, who represents you. Um, but one of the challenges we face is a lot of times people don't know who represents them at the state legislative or local levels in the first place. Um, so with our new mobile app, what we do is we use geolocation, uh, yes, asking for a little bit of private information to try to match you automatically with the people that represent you such that you are automatically deliver their statements, their ratings, their votes that are pertinent. Um, what we're hoping to do is move towards more tools, more ideas that just try different educational approaches. I was a teacher before I worked with VoteSmart, um, and I know that in, even with smaller classrooms I had of 10 to 15 students, each one learned in a different way, each one was drawn to material in a different way. So as I've talked to different groups, talked to different people who want to use our data, I've always encouraged them to think of new ways to reach new audiences that will make it appealing to them. Um, we have had partnerships that have tried to do that. In 2016, we worked with NBC and Telemundo to take our data and put it up in Spanish to create a candidate match tool where you would answer the same questions candidates would be asked and then form a match, which maybe sometimes would match you with someone you wouldn't be expecting to. We get lots of angry calls about people who are matched with Bernie as opposed to Hillary, and we just <laughs> have to deflect those a little bit and maybe challenge them um, what they thought they believed. Um, but that's our challenge in a lot of ways, and I think that, that can be translated to people in journalism, to those of you in this room, to think about how to make your information not just factual, but there's also an appealing element, too. Um, that's something that we're definitely working on. Does that, either of you want to weigh in on that before I well, move just on? Just tell me what you guys think about this. I was talking to an Iowa leader this morning about the, the state of journalism and, and news, and, and the suggestion was something I thought was pretty intriguing that he said is maybe it's time for a remake of uh, the, the, the local news industry, that what if it's time for Buffett, Bezos, and Gates to each commit $5 billion and start a, a nonprofit news agency and station uh, investigative journalists in state capitals around the country and just give them a, a long leash and uh, you know have it be a very independent model like the Texas Independent or Nevada Independent and just start you know, move away from for-profit journalism and get into nonprofit and independent journalism. I, I'd love to talk to you guys afterwards if any of you have any any thoughts on that, but that's something to think about. And, and Michael, unless you want to weigh in on that, I, I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, we, we feel, I think, in the industry that the First Amendment and, and our First Amendment freedoms are under attack. Um, are they really in danger, though, or does it just feel that way? And, and what, what kind of trends are you seeing um, when it comes to the legal side uh, of uh, trying to defend the First Amendment? Well, I, I'd like to calm the waters and say that, that the law is, is in good shape in states, especially like Iowa, and I think that it will stay that way as long as we have an independent judiciary that itself is funded and that is truly independent. So when you have states where judges are elected, I think you need to fear about freedoms more in those states. In states where, uh, in, in Iowa, it's a negative form of, of election where the retention, where we had the three justices of the Iowa Supreme Court voted out because of a campaign that disagreed because of uh, the same-sex marriage, or as I like to call the freedom of marriage case, 
uh, that because of that. I think that says it can happen here, but I, I don't think that that's where we should be alarmed. And, and the other part about it is uh, when you look at the federal judiciary and, and if the Trump administration's sole uh, achievement is going to be Gorsuch, then uh, again, I'm not ter terribly uh, nervous about that because oftentimes the most conservative Republicans nominate libertarian who do understand the value of the First Amendment. The Roberts Court is being identified and, and, and Chief Justice Roberts himself is writing a number of First Amendment cases. And if you look, and if you look at the cases that as, as they are breaking, they break toward liberty, they break toward expression. And so those, I think, we should take comfort in. But what I'm concerned about is not the freedom and the law or the courts, but it's the electorate and the legislature. And so if, if you ask, is it important to the electorate that there be a free press, I don't think you want to put that to a vote. I think that the electorate might say, no, we don't care. We, we, we're, we're tired of an arrogant press telling us what we need to know and not telling us what we want to know. And, I, and so from that standpoint, I think we do need to be concerned. Think about this last election. Uh, the, the phrase that, that I hear many people in, in Jennifer's position, that they say, well, it's baked in the cake that all of the Trump, that Trump's abuses are baked in the cake, meaning that we knew those before he was elected, we elected him anyway, and therefore they didn't matter. Well, if things are baked in the cake, uh, what information is important? And I think that's a threat, if we don't know what's important. And then lastly, I just anecdotally, because we've talked about this before, um, what I've been most proud about being an Iowa lawyer for some 40 years is that it may be longer than that, I, have to, I can't do the math. But um, we in this state have had very few libel cases against news organizations. In part, it was because of what Barbara Mack and the Register Law Department did over the years to insulate and, and to inoculate uh, news organizations because plaintiff's lawyers wouldn't take the cases because they knew they would fight and lose. But I presently have pending three libel cases which is more than I've had since I worked at the Register. And so if you think about that, th then I think there is an effect of calling it fake news and calling it uh, unimportant and having people say, I don't like news organizations because lawyers are willing to take the cases now and I think formerly they were not. And that of course has uh, an exacerbating effect because the more money uh, our news organizations have to spend defending lawsuits, the less money they have to make sure that their news product is accurate. So well, let, let me defend that one second though. What price is there for freedom? <laughs> yes, yes, uh, exactly. Well, I, I, you know, I, I think it, 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 Mike Judas says he's been worth every penny <laughs> that, that the Des Moines Register has spent in no. many, many ways that we won't even get into. No, but, and, and, and not to, but, but you should know, in newsrooms, I, I have had newsrooms, including the one that you work with say, we could fight this fight on open records and pay you X, or we could keep one more reporter in the newsroom. And I can't argue with that. I can't say, let a, let a reporter go so we can fight this open records case. You don't do that. You yeah. can't do that. Yeah. Okay, let's start uh, with uh, some questions from the audience. Um, uh, anybody want to kick it off here? I know you people aren't shy. So yes, ma'am, right here. And you can ask us anything, and you can ask me questions too if you want. <laughs> well, when uh, we're talking about funding, I was curious that, um, uh, and maybe it was just didn't come in the realm of, of First Amendment, but um, the uh, way that um, certain uh, uh, conglomerates are are um, buying up some of the um, outlets, news outlets, whether print or um, TV or whatever, uh, sometimes radio, and uh, one of the ones that is in the news right now is the Sinclair Broadcasting and what they are doing um, uh, as a result, I believe, of sort of, there used to be a cap on how many of these you could own, many, uh, how many outlets you could own, and now that is 
uh, they're petitioning to have that to go away. And, and I know that um, also just right here in Des Moines, we had um, uh, Meredith pr um, acquire time. So maybe a little bit about how that could endanger our, the accuracy or perception of accuracy um, in media. Yeah, um, so I'll, I just w would just say that um, uh, we had a, um, a, a situation where some friends of mine at the Denver Post just lost their job, like 30 people were let go, um, because they were acquired by um, a non-journalism uh, business um, that is, you know, it has a reputation um, and track record of just squeezing all of the money out of, of news organizations and um, and you know even journalism organizations are uh, subject to the pressures of shareholders and their profit expectations um, and so we've had to work within those constraints you know being part of Gannett is um, also a benefit for the register um, because we have some buffer in and if the local economy goes south um, but and we have some help with our infrastructure and that kind of thing um, but we also when um, we, if the company as a whole is uh, you know having having problems we are also subjected to those pressures so um, so I do think you know that makes uh, Jennifer's discussion about you know do we look at some nonprofit models um, to be pretty interesting um, if anybody I else I want to hear what Mike has to say about the antitrust th theory and the idea of news organizations merging First, I just from a side note, I think that the newspaper business has done a pretty good job of becoming nonprofit. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> I think, oh, uh, zing! <laughs> but, um, a couple, uh, a couple of thoughts. Again, so much of it, I look at it and say that what what voice would you be willing to give up in a minute? Of all the voices that you have coming at you. You can say, oh, I could live without Facebook, or I could live without Twitter, or I could live without Bloomberg, or I could live without the Des Moines Register. You can pick, and, and you probably could live without, without any single one of them. But is there one that you could not live without? And what is that voice? And is that voice jeopardized? And, and I would like to think that, that, that uh, there are some of those that I simply think I cannot live without. Uh, whether it's on a local or on a national basis. What will happen, there is less pressure if they're owned by wealthy people. I think the Washington Post clearly is a better paper in the last two or three years it is. after the Grams. The Grams were wonderful stewards for all those years, but Bezos has, has allowed it to be independent. I think if you look at the, the Star Tribune in Minneapolis, uh, since it's now locally owned again by a wealthy individual, it's renewing itself much as if it was owned by the Coles family. And so you, you can see those kinds of things. The Sinclair thing, if you watch the Deadspin news, the Deadspin uh, conglomeration this weekend, where every Sinclair station was required to have the local anchors read the same script, Deadspin then put them together and uh, showed how ridiculous it sounded to have all these local news anchors talking about fake news as if they, they really were we're doing anything other than reading a teleprompter. Those are the kinds of things that I think will, will remedy Sinclair's of the world if they think that they can force feed information that people do not want. On the other hand, I've always felt that, that government should stay out of who is the voice in any particular town. And so if government is saying that a newspaper, it still says a newspaper and broadcast can't be co-owned in the same market, but you can own, under the, the, the more liberalized rules, you can own two, two, TV, uh, two, two TV stations in a market, or you can have uh, local marketing agreements that allow, uh, in Des Moines, uh, at least two of the TV stations, they, they supply the local news on a, a second TV station. So all of those things, I think these, again, aren't new problems. It, it is, the problem becomes if it eliminates that single voice that you absolutely have to have. And I don't know who that is for each of you, but I think that you should say, all right, what is my baseline? What can I live, I cannot live without it. And um, I, I think, I, I guess I don't fear the Sinclairs of the world. I don't fear the, the Meredith. I think that those are all ways to, to make, bus make businesses work. 
but it's interesting that the best local news seems to be by people who don't need to make money. <laughs> uh, another question, uh, Beata. So I'm gonna ask a question which probably comes from a very different angle, uh, but there is now increasing interest in the field of computer science in attributes of data which indicate whether the data are reliable, credible, trustworthy, et cetera. You know, whether it's World Bank data on various types of um, infrastructure projects or whether it's the incredible proliferation of fake news. Um, are major news organizations starting to work with um, machine learning experts, artificial intelligence experts, as a way of flagging information that is likely to be false. I mean, it's never gonna replace the journalist who's gonna have to look at it, um, you know, if you like by hand, but it might give you a first estimate of what might be credible versus not be credible. I mean, is this time to bring a whole different community into the conversation? I, I wanna ask Walker first though, because he, he actually has a huge database. Um, and, you know, do you, do you subject, yeah, he has it in his pocket actually. Uh, <laughs> Uh, all right, not going there. Uh, do you have, um, you know, anything, do you, do you do that to find out whether the information that you have is actually reliable? And that's, I appreciate you directing it this way. I think, um, of course, we're, like you said, we're not a media organization, but we are an information organization. Um, we do use some machines, machine learning in the capacity at the moment of trying to understand what different data points are about in the first place. Um, a lot of the way we use computer science, which is exciting, is in some ways just for the collection and organization of data in the first place. And that's, that's been around for a while. Um, one of probably our things we're most proud of is our large scale relational database that has all this information that when journalists who are perhaps trained in computer science get their hands on, they're pretty excited about it. Um, we have found that actually trying to do fact checking is one step even further than we're able to do at the moment. Um, we did a lot of work on this in 2016, the summer of 2016, to try to understand what a, say, press release or a statement on the floor of the House or Senate or, say, an op-ed was, what was it about? Synthesizing it from many, many pages to something even shorter or just a few key words. And to use this anecdote, we, we found there's a lot of variation in what we could teach the machine to do. Um, it's still a very new field. We could, for instance, take a press release down to pretty basic information, trying to s s suss out what's being said on the floor of the Senate or House when there could be interruptions, when there could be uh, interjections, pauses. That's a little bit harder. Um, and so it's been something we've worked with some academics on. Um, our goal isn't so much that's poor fact checking. Uh, we have members of our board who work with political fact and fact check. Um, but it's a challenge, but one that we're trying to use our tools to um, do even better. Uh, Jennifer, you were gonna add something. Th that's a great answer. I'll just say really quickly, so the AP, the Associated Press, teamed up with Facebook to do some fact checking of, of stories that end up on Facebook, so that's definitely something to look into. It's a really interesting project. Yeah, and I can imagine there could be simple indicators that might help people. For instance, when we cite our sources, we're trying to link it back to .gov sources or pure primary sources, perhaps some sort of database that tracks these are definitely credible first prime, first hand primary sources and then checking the sources of various other information pieces like uh, news articles, that could be one way to do it. But in terms of trying to learn just from the content itself, that'd be exciting but challenging. Michael, do you think AI fact checking will hold up in court? <laughs> no, it, 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 I think the issue We've developed this libel law that says that in the case of public figures and public officials, we need breathing space to make mistakes. <clears throat> and breathing space to make mistakes, though, that we've defined the standard to be what is the state of mind of the journalist toward the facts. So it's, it's not a state of mind toward the subject of the, of the news report, but it's toward the facts. Well, if the journalist isn't involved, how can there possibly be a state of mind toward the facts? And if we've abdicated to machine learning or to algorithms, uh, I don't know how we defend it. I think it's indefensible. But at the same time, I think one of the key points that you bring up is encouraging more people in this world of information sharing to be from the computer science community. Um, and perhaps those designers then could lend uh, better, uh, better hands to this information. But, but is, it, is, it, is it the Wizard of Oz? Yeah, who's so behind the curtain? Who's behind the curtain? Yeah, no. 
And I think though that journalists and people who in your field who use computer science can lend a lot of a lot of great tools to these problems we're facing. Not ones that necessarily solve 100 well, percent though. And, and that's where again I always I always think about the, how how I don't understand these things and therefore in my simple life relate to them. I go to the register, I go to the local broadcaster, and there's a, a news report about a car crash, a fatal, and then what ad pops up through the artificial intelligence, but it's a funeral home. And so it's like, okay, so who is the mastermind behind this? And if the ad people can't get it right, how do we expect the news people to get it right? My husband used to be in local TV news, and uh, one of the stories he tells is um, about how they're, they're, they had humans uh, that were supposed to be in charge of trafficking traffic and figuring out where the ads were to go in the newscast. And they had one story about the death of a prominent um, a community member, and it led right into an ad um, where the uh, the music for the ad, I don't remember what the um, what the product was, but the music was Happy Trails to You. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, horror stories can happen no matter what. I, yes, Angela. Okay. The um, uh, topic or discussion of uh, uh, a business model for a uh, nonprofit news organization has been around for a long time. It would be wonderful to actually see it move forward. I, I, I love the discussion that you're having with possibilities of funders for such an entity. And it, it seems to me a, a, an entity like Vote Smart might be a good organization to, it's already established to fund as I don't know if there's any discussion of eventually wanting to expand in not only a fact-checking uh, uh, database organization, but uh, a reliable news organization if you had the correct funding. And I'll, I'll come back to that question to you. But I just want to say that um, we in the Gr uh, Greenlee School are constantly doing exercises and meeting with our students and having discussions on uh, how to identify fake news. And it's really interesting in some of these sessions that. Um, where we, we hand out a fake news story and we ask educated people and students who are in our program to say, what do you think about this story? You know, and we don't even tell them yet it's fake. And they read through it and you know, yeah, yeah, that's good. And then you start uh, pointing out, well, look at the sources that are cited and uh, look at the date of the thing that they're reporting on. When did it happen? I mean, all the basic news, uh, judgments of news that we teach in the school if you're educated, uh, and, and we still miss them, you know, because in these discussions, it will not come out right away that it, it's, this, is, this is a fake, fake news story. Uh, uh, but there are, are all kinds of tools and training techniques that we are trying to do in the Greenlee School, and we really feel that uh, it's, it's a human skill in addition to a computer skill, and uh, that media literacy is, is really more important and that's another topic we've been talking about for 20, 25, 30 years. But media literacy today is more important than ever. And so then back to your question, what about, or my question to <laughs> Walker, the idea of have you ever thought about expanding into a news organization? Absolutely, and I've, I've, I'm excited to yes, hear Walker. the idea. Yeah, right. <laughs> and I've heard it percolate elsewhere. I was telling uh, before the panel a little bit about how I think David Yepsen brought it up a couple weeks ago to panel at Drake. Um, so. First, what I'll say is that our mission is to provide free, factual, unbiased information on candidates and officials to all Americans. Um, that lends a lot of space to do a lot of things. One of the things we get asked about, too, in this world of could you do more, uh, would be covering local level officials at the same level of breadth and depth, which has a whole host of challenges uh, to itself. And at, our response is, yes, we'd love to. We don't have the resources. Um, in terms of this question of taking on more news-related uh, information, possibly if it were directly tied to candidates and officials, again, that's a key component. We're not pretending to offer the facts on everything. Um, we aren't necessarily providing information on, for example, we don't have a page on our website that says whether climate change is real or not. That's not within our mission, that's not within our scope. So there are components where we could try to do more to actually write up this sort of information. We're launching a blog soon at blog.votesmart.org, which might have this kind of information. Uh, when you brought up, though, Jennifer, the, um, the idea of nonpartisan news organizations, I think one key component, if that would be a route that would be pursued, is sustained funding. Um, our experience, again, as an information organization uh, was that we were helped found by 
major uh, foundations, including Pew, Carnegie, Knight, um, but those were largely starting funds, and now we're sustained by our members. Um, and that sort of funding model is limiting. We're very fortunate to have those people across the country who believe in our work, um, but it does not necessarily allow the same funds to uh, do all the things that a major news organization might. So I would just caution that in the event that a news organization would look towards a nonprofit model, that whatever the sustaining funding source is, it is a long-term commitment, not just a startup commitment. Because one of the things we face is that People give to their passions, and sometimes it can be hard to encourage them that nonpartisanship, simple information is a passion. Uh, for some it is, uh, but not necessarily for everyone. For us weird people it is. Uh, who, else has, who else has a question? While you guys are raising your hand, oh, okay. While you guys are raising your hands, um, I just wanted to ask, um, first of all, um, Walker, you mentioned, um, you mentioned privacy. Um, and, and that you are you collect private data um, for some things from your audience. What do you do with that, and how do you safeguard it? Great question. So in one sense, um, with the, the, the example that I gave, our OnPoint, our mobile app uh, for Android and iOS, that information is luckily stored, uh, just cached on the device itself, um, and that is something that is optional for a user to opt into. Uh, we did have long discussions about are people going to opt into this, do we want to even get into the game of offering this, this, this tool? Um, and ultimately we decided that it was worth it because, to cite an example, if we just allowed people to plug in their zip code in certain districts, that's not going to get you pinpointed close enough to the right legislative district, especially at the state level. So we don't actually store that information on our own servers, which is a good thing to privacy. In terms of our membership base, that is information that we do house um, in order to communicate with them. Uh, we do safeguard that through a lot of different procedures. We don't share it with any other organizations. That's been very central since our founding that we aren't providing lists of our members to other organizations that might do similar work. So it is very key to the information um, that we collect. And it contrasts then with the candidates that we're covering who are trying to then provide information on to the public. I try to tell uh, students when I'm talking to them that um, trying to encourage them to pay for their their media, and I tell them that you know if if you're getting it for free, you're paying in some other way, uh, right? Probably with your privacy and your data. And I'm I'm glad to hear that the uh, vote smart is an exception to that. I think uh, Myrna, you have a yeah, question. Yes, I just had a question, just specific to media literacy, um, and just being literate with regards to the information that so many consumers are taking in. Um, in this room, we're educated, fairly affluent, but there is a whole swath of the population that gets the information and reads it and really doesn't have the time to vet that information and say whether it's, you know, analyze it and say whether it's true or false. How do you all navigate that? And, and it's a huge responsibility for journalists but, but how do you navigate that and what uh, parameters do you put or guardrails are there that currently exist or should exist for the wide swath of individuals who are not armed with that information? Anybody wanna, wanna jump in there first? I'll just jump in to say that one of the areas that we do try to provide resources for uh, is teachers. We think that teachers are an especially important conduit towards civic education about our own tools a little bit selfishly, maybe altruistically, um, but just to also teach students the importance of primary information, primary sources, typically in the context of maybe civics, education, which is not necessarily the same thing as media literacy, but there are similarities. Um, and we've unfortunately observed and had other people interested in our field talk to us about the decline of funding for civic education, which can be a challenge that might only exacerbate that issue, um, which is scary to us. It certainly gives us another reason to be in existence and to be free to people. But if people don't teach students, teach p the people that are going to become citizens and news uh, digesters, uh, consumers, um, how to verify their sources, it might all be for naught. One of the things that I just want to say quickly on that topic, um, it, it jogged my memory when we brought up computer sciences <laughs> earlier, that I think we can be, hopefully, and this is a different sphere with professional teachers, creative about how we do civic education. We tend to say favor, at least currently, STEM and money for STEM as opposed to civics education or other areas. Well, do those things work together? Can those things work together? Can you do work in science and technology and computer sciences that would overlap with information technology and overlap 
with political information or civic information. And I'm not sure those two need to be bifurcated, and I think that perhaps we shouldn't look at it as a, as a, um, as a, as a win or a loss in either column, and that could be helpful towards media literacy. A little bit related, perhaps, to the, the question. Um, I've had a concern for a long time about how um, our uh, news judgment models have changed based on the feedback we get from our audience based on the, the, the clicks that they give us, okay? And, um, you know, my concern is that are, are we sidelining important stories um, that we should be telling, um, but we're not because those communities um, do not have the technology to, uh, you know, to click, right? And, and so, uh, you know, we feel like, okay, well, people don't care about this story. You know, I, I think at the Des Moines Register, we try to um, say to, you know, to our reporters, we're still going to tell stories that are important, even if they're not um, generating as many clicks, uh, that, you know, we're telling important stories about the community. Um, but I, I worry about that, um, and you know, I'd love to hear any ideas that people have uh, from the room about that uh, and from the panel. And secondly, um, as our newsrooms have shrunk um, in, in staff, um, I, I, feel, I fear that they are also shrinking in diversity. Um, I, I don't think our Des Moines Register newsroom is, is as diverse as it was 14 years ago when I started. And so uh, I, you know, I think that is something where uh, those of us in the room who are hiring people, um, uh, you know, I, I think that having a more diverse newsroom leads to more diverse storytelling. And so um, you know, I, I'd love to hear thoughts about that as well from you guys or from the, from the room. It's, I don't think about clicks anymore because um, anything that I report on Trump gets so many clicks. <laughs> it's, it just makes my job easy. Yesterday on the Bloomberg website, I noticed our top five stories were about Trump, 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 and Trump. So it's just not something that, but I, I hear exactly what you're saying, and I, that's something that is, is worrisome to me that other news outlets are so concerned about driving their reporters. Um, to, to only write stories that are going to get big readership and big clicks and, and what that does to the rest of journalism. It's very, that's a very important issue. I wish everything I wrote about Trump got, you know, <laughs> enormous clicks. On that front, I, I'm concerned that the literacy question that, that we're starting too broad and we're starting with the audience rather than starting with, with the people who are putting out the information. Because if we are evaluating reporters or evaluating editors based on the number of clicks a story has, are we being literate ourselves in, in what we're doing? And, and it used to be that, that, that if you were only concerned about reaching the lowest common denominator, then maybe you were in the wrong business. And so I, I think your question very well could be addressed by saying, should the literacy be with this group rather than with the audience? And should we be talking about well, what, what is important that we do, and, and why do we measure things that then only debase the product or debase the information rather than improve it? Yes, Dean. Well, my experience generally is limited to Iowa, and I, I think that the Iowa courts have done a very good job of consistently applying it with a idea of protecting information and freedom. The uh, Iowa Supreme Court, there are justices who will be plaintiff-oriented and justices who will be defense-oriented, and that carries through irrespective of the subject matter of the case, but I th tend to think that the plaintiff justices move more toward freedom and ideology in cases of libel and privacy. Again, I think it's in part because of this state's placing personal freedoms at the top. And so it's not just that we boast about solid First Amendment grounds or solid, in Iowa it's Article 1, Section 7 of the Iowa Constitution. It's not just that, Dean. I think it's also where you have, uh, whether you talk about the right to marry, or, or that this was one of the first uh, states to say that we were going to have separation of 
church and state when it came to schools. When I think it was a 1910 or 1912 case in, in Carroll County where the public school was in the parish, in the parish building, and, and the Iowa Supreme Court said, we're not going to do that. So we've got a great foundation in this state, and I think the justices recognize not only do they need to be progressive in protecting today, but they need to be respectful of, of how we've always had that tradition and history of protecting people. So I, I think it is pretty consistent. Do we win every case? No, we don't. Um, but sometimes our clients, uh, we, this is how we usually say it. We say that our clients win and the lawyers lose. And, but, but always the clients are the ones that come up with the facts. And if our clients have made an error in, in fact, it's really, really hard to then convince the court that there should be no liability. And so I think that ties it all back to this whole idea of fake news and fake journalism. And what Jennifer started us out with, if we're factually accurate, if people don't want it, that's one thing. But if it's factually accurate, it isn't fake. Yeah. yeah. In fact, our, our company has said, tr don't use the phrase fake news um, because it's not accurate. If it's fake, it's not news, right? <laughs> um, and if it's news, it's, it's real. It's not fake. Um, that hour just totally flew by, and I promised I would end on time so that you all could get lunch on time. So let's thank the panel. And thanks to you guys for your great questions. Thank you. This is fabulous. We appreciate it so much. OK, we're going to have lunch. If you would go out through these doors rather than this one over here, there will be two lines for lunch.